Francis Levy. Ed Nersessian and I are co-directors of the Philatelli Center. Now, this gentleman here is Ed Nersessian, and he wants you to know he's not a member of the roundtable because if so many people came, he took one of the chairs. <laughs> want to make sure he's not a bona fide member. Uh, before we begin this afternoon's program, I wanted to call your attention to the e exhibit on the walls, which has been curated by Hallie Cohen, and uh, not curated, but helped. Uh, uh, who, Hallie, who was the exact curator of the... Andrew Raftery from uh, Rhode Island School of Design. Andrew Raftery from the Rhode Island School of Design. Hallie is the overall curator of the exhibition space, but it's, it's, it's a Philipson Bible and Freud's imagination, and it's attendant upon our roundtable on psychoanalysis, Philipson Bible and Freud's imagination, which we had several weeks ago, and these are images that Freud had studied when he was a child at, uh, at really on the knee of his father and so we, it, it, the significance of the exhibition has to do with those kinds of influences that uh, were in making of Sigmund Freud and if you look at it carefully it's a rather interesting show and all Philip Tate's roundtables are simulcast and after the roundtable is over you can go see it on, in past programming. You simply go to past programming and, and hit the button which says the program you want to see and it comes up usually three to four days after we have an event an event. I am now pleased to introduce Louise Yellen. Louise Yellen is Interim Dean of Humanities, Professor of Literature, and Adjunct Curator at the Newberger Museum of Art, all at Purchase College, State University of New York. She is the author of From the Margins of Empire, Christina Stead, Doris Letting, Lessing, Nadine Gord Gordimer, and numerous essays on feminism, narrative, and identity. She is currently working on two projects. She is curating British subjects, identity and self-fashioning, 1948 through 2000, an exhibition of recent and contemporary self-portraits at the Newberger Museum of Art, and writing a book entitled British Lives, Windrush to Parak, about autobiography and self-portraiture in Britain since the Second World War. So you can see why we were interested in having Louise Yellen here. Both projects explore the intersection of individual and collective, national and transnational ways of understanding, representing, and fashioning identity. Dr. Yellen will preside and moderate over this afternoon's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. So take it away, Louise. Thank you. I also know Louise for many years. Yes. Long, long time. Yeah. I, because I follow instructions, I'm not going to repeat what's on the website about my co-panelists. So I invite you to look up their entries and hear more about them. I want to thank the Philip T.D. Center for inviting me to discuss autobiography and biography with the participants in this roundtable, whom I'll now introduce. First, in alphabetical order, Nicholson Baker has published seven novels and four works of nonfiction, including You and I, a key instance of what autobiography scholars call auto-slash-biographical -bio reflection. He founded the American Newspaper Repository, now at Duke University, and has written about the importance of printed words on paper, among other topics. He has a novel coming out this next September, 09, and he's currently working on a book on the Cold War. Next, uh, David Shields, oh, wait a minute, oh, yeah, well, alphabetically, sorry. David Shields has published 10 books of fiction and nonfiction. He's been widely translated and awarded numerous prizes, grants, and fellowships. You can read all about them on the website. His current project is called Reality Hunger, a Manifesto, which will be out from Knopf in 2010. And it's an argument for the obliteration of genre and copyright and in favor of the essay as a writing form. Uh, Judith Thurman, whom I've also known for many years, is the author of biographies of Isaac Dinesen and Colette, the latter shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize. She's a staff writer at The New Yorker, and she's currently working on pieces on lost languages Laura Ingalls Wilder and her daughter, and the French playwright, Yasmin Reza. Simon, Simon Winchester, who arrived in an ice storm, I, you know, I was going to make a note that he couldn't make it, but he did, is an author, journalist, and broadcaster who has worked mainly as a foreign correspondent. His numerous books, including The Professor and the Madman, uh, his, his numerous books include The Professor and the Madman, which is a double biography about James Murray, who's the editor of the OED, and the mad American doctor, who was a major contributor to the enterprise. He's currently writing a biography of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, I'm, as moderator, I'm supposed to get this uh, panel going. So I thought I would read a short passage from uh, the book that I'm currently reading. It's Dreams from, from My Father, um, Obama's first memoir. Who is who? Oh, okay. Judith Thurman, you know, because she's the only woman other than myself on the panel. <laughs> Nicholson Baker, um, David Shields, and Simon Winchester. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to read you a passage from early in this memoir when uh, Barack Obama, about, you know, about to be elected senator, is ruminating on his, on his early life. Um, and he, he says over and over again, but in different ways, that he doesn't really know who he is. He doesn't really know where he came from. And he can't quite identify with any of the identity groups uh, that want to claim him. Over the next few months, so, so this, there's a, then there's a white space on the page. I like the white spaces. Over the next few months, I looked to corroborate this nightmare vision. I gathered up books from the library, Baldwin, Ellison, Hughes, Wright, Du Bois. At night, I would close the door to my room, telling my grandparents I had homework to do. And there, I would sit and wrestle with words, locked in suddenly desperate argument, trying to reconcile the world as I'd found it with the terms of my birth. But there was no escape to be had. In every page of every book, in Bigger Thomas and Invisible Men, I kept finding the same anguish, the same doubt, a self-contempt that neither irony nor intellect seemed able to deflect. Even Du Bois's learning and Baldwin's love and Langston's humor eventually succumbed to its corrosive force. Each man finally forced to doubt art's redemptive power, each man finally forced to withdraw, one to Africa, one to Europe, one deeper into the bowels of Harlem, but all of them in the same weary flight all of them exhausted, bitter men, the devil at their heels. So uh, I was interested in this passage, among others, because in some way, um, the self written about, that is the young Barack Obama, finds in his reading some answer to who he thinks he is or who he thinks he might be. Um, it's in his, through his reading that he begins to be able to ask and answer the question, who am I? And I, I wanted to start off by asking any one of you, um, if you can figure out which one wants to jump in, how uh, uh, similar situations play out in the biographies or autobiographies that you've written. That is, you, you read, I think I'll start by asking Nicholson, um, how, how does the scene of reading play out in your biographical and autobiographical writing, or your thoughts about well, that I think writing? Well, uh, the, the way it works for me is that um, we had an alcove in my house that had all these books on it. They had wonderful names that, that seemed mysterious and interesting, and one was uh, Memoirs of an English Opium Eater. And I, <laughs> I thought, my, that, and it was a tiny little leather-bound book that my that had my grandfather's signature in it. And I knew he'd he'd had a drinking problem, and I thought, my God, this is fascinating. Maybe this is the key to everything. And I pulled it down, and it was this it just lush, non-fictional but highly elaborated prose chronicle uh, that was that 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 attained a kind of poetry that I loved. That was um, that was about this man's travails with opium so th that was a, what was a, for me it was just that we had a lot of old books in my house and I would pull them down and and read them and some of them pulled me in and and made me want to uh, try to even come close oh I in writing about writers very often they seem to be my subjects um, without generalizing too much there are often people who are born into a milieu which is not uh, it, it, does, it doesn't really offer them a reflection, which they seek uh, in books from, uh, they, they seek friendships, a sort of kind of spiritual friendships with other writers. And that becomes the real 
a real community of people whom they probably will never meet or may not ever need to meet, but uh, that is the world that's real to them. And, and I was writing about Antonia Byatt's possession many years ago. Uh, and you start out by, by having a kind of love affair with, uh, with another writer who becomes um, uh, an important person in your life. And that sort of, you graduate from that into a love affair with language. I think that's the trajectory for many, many writers whom, whom I've written about. Certainly it was true of Denison and, and uh, coming from a very bourgeois family and, and, and longing for uh, a, a kind of grandeur that she got from books. Um, so uh, it's, it's sometimes a product of isolation. I had certainly, in writing about James Murray, editor of the OED, uh, has no better starting point than the OED itself, of course, his monument, which certainly imbues one with an enormous respect for language and a great fondness and love for it. So, um, but it is enormous. There's a chap called Amon Shea who's just written a book called Reading the OED, in which he spent an entire year reading however many 13,000 pages of it, and I didn't do that, admittedly. But I think to know where Murray was coming from, it was important to know where he went and to therefore read or immerse oneself in the majesty of the OED, and I certainly did that to a very great degree. You asked Louise about reading as a site for your own writing project, and for me it's almost literally so in the sense that this book of mine that's coming out in a year or so is full. I mean, the reading, I feel like that reading and writing have become virtually indistinguishable for, you know, a lot of, of my books are sort of collage-like and built from other people's reading, but they've been edited in such a harsh and subjective way, not unlike Nick Baker's Human Smoke, you know, where Nick... Uh, ostensibly is just running passages from journalistic accounts, but edited them in such a subjective, I would say sort of cutthroat way to make an, a, an argument that, it, that interests me very much, sort of reading as a form of composition. Okay, I, I sent you a note about, I'm, a scholar of autobiography, but you're all biographers. Um, so what, I'm, what I really want to ask you about is, um, okay, here's what, here's what George, George Gustorf, who's a, scholar, who's a theorist of autobiography, said. He said that auto, autobiography is the testimony of a man about himself. He was writing in the 50s, so we'll excuse him. Uh, the testimony of a man about himself the contest of a being in dialogue with itself. Um, I'm wondering how you think this is, something like this is relevant to the project of autobiography, of biography, if you think it is. Uh, Could you repeat the quote, sure. please? I didn't quite catch it. Autobiography is the testimony of a man about himself, the contest of a being in dialogue with itself. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if there's something similar going on in the writing of biography? Well, you certainly have a dialogue with your subject, um, often a contentious one. Um, uh, it's very intimate. It, it, resembles, uh, it, rese it resembles parents and child or lover to, to lovers or to enemies or boss or uh, any sort of uh, kind of duad you can think of is, is present in the, in the working out of the authority to tell the story. Um, it's very much about authority, it's, and it's, it is a dialogue with yourself in that you have to jettison as you go the scaffolding of received ideas, uh, theories, isms um, that help in the beginning to just sort of reduce the enormous amount of material, funnel it uh, into something that's digestible and that is sort of becomes organic, isn't just doesn't, isn't cerebral. Um, and you're the prism, so uh, uh, nothing is objective, um, but how, uh, I suppose, how you regulate the subjectivity, that is, comes from your self-scrutiny and your, um, self, your dissatisfaction and your sense that you haven't gotten to the place you want to get to. None of us here, I believe, is, <coughs> would describe an, each other or oneself as a historian. 
And I think there's a big difference in the way historians approach biography, and we approach biography, I believe, anyway. I assume most historians attempt to get the full picture, the definitive picture, the neutral picture. Whereas I think ours has have to be filtered through or pass through the prism of our own understanding and our own prejudices and things. I mean, I think, for instance, that the most recent book I've done is about a, a Cambridge academic called Joseph Needham, who um, wrote about China, spent the latter half of his life writing about China. But he came to China by having an adulterous affair with a Chinese woman, an affair which was tolerated by his complacent wife. Who remained to whom he remained married for the rest of his life. When she died, he then married the woman that he had been having the affair with, who had been waiting patiently for 51 years in the wings. <laughs> and so there's a sort, there's a wonderfully poetic story. But had someone else written this book, they might have utterly disapproved of what led him to China, and regarded him as a, a scamp or much worse. On the other hand, had David McCullough written the book, I dare say it would have been presented in a much more neutral tone. And I think um, that is a point that we must all bear in mind, I assume, when we write biographies. So to that extent, I agree with the dialogue with oneself, but it's a, and a very subjective um, approach, and certainly one that I take and happily and willingly, although you, you caught bad reviews. I mean, that's something to me that you, the does really interestingly in your long essays in the New Yorker. The way that I read them is that they're ostensibly about a subject out there. Like I was just rereading your essay about the woman whose name I forget, who is a sort of obsessive dieter. Oh, uh, Vanessa ben Beecraft? Yeah. The artist? Yeah, and that to me they're always beautifully sculpted in such a way that it looks like you're looking at a window, but you're really looking through a kind of mirror that, you know, you, you sort of, you're painting these pictures, which often are sort of self-portraits in a, a convex mirror. And mm -hmm. I just really admire the way that you do this thing that Louise was talking about, that just that you, there's always a moment where you, is suddenly we get a sort of self-revelation. I'm just, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be a sort of moderator here, but no, that, you, that you do this thing where you, it looks like a pseudo, pseudo, pseudo objective portrait, and then suddenly there's this moment of sort of subject, subjective and often quite personal revelation. I'm very, you put it so beautifully. I'm very moved by the way you put it. it, it uh, I guess I'm always looking for something, and I never know what it is until that sentence writes itself. Uh, and it comes out of somewhere, uh, and then that there's a moment of terrific release at that at that point, and I uh, and I uh, am happy at that point to be a writer, which is not true 99 percent of the time. <laughs> but, but starting it, you don't know that that's no, the case. You're just know. like, oh gee, I'm interested in this so, in this person because the subject was assigned to me, or I'm or I've heard about them. But that it's not like the, the, you know what the what the identification is from the beginning. That, I guess Only there would vaguely be no point or, in... or intellectually. I don't know viscerally. And right. it's the visceral thing that always surprises me. Right. Absolutely. How do you, how do you choose, how do you all choose your subjects? The, the one thing you have to, I, I've never written a full book length biography because I have this fear. I think it's what you're talking about is that you, I, I fear that I would get two thirds of the way into the book and feel that this man or woman was not my friend, you know, that, that I couldn't go on, that I couldn't invest the full force of my enthusiasm in this person, that I couldn't love him. So I tend to to, to want to have uh, biographical moments that are very brief in which I can be truly an enthusiast of, the, of this moment in a person's life and celebrate that and then, and then kind of move on to the next guy. Um, and, but I really admire the ability. It does, it, 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 not only the beautiful short essays, but but the the, the ability to, to to make a full arch and to have that a tremendous acknowledgement section where you thank innumerable <laughs> libraries, all the people who gave their personal letters, and it's you know that's the real kind of biographical 
effort, and I've never done it. Louise, can I interject for a second? You know, we are situated in an analytic institute, although we are not part of the institute, actually. But, the, but is the concept of transference playing a role here in, in terms of the fact of the identification with the person or the, and also from a, from a, from a kind of a distorted point of view with the, the kind of subjectivization of the uh, point of view towards the subject? Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell an anecdote about my own uh, career, and that is that I only realized after I had been doing work on women writers and national identity for a really long time, that my attention was always drawn to um, women writers who wrote about daughters and fathers. So I would say, <laughs> inevitably, that, that all writing is transferential in some way, and would really like to hear from the uh, other roundtable people about, I think Judith has already testified. Right. But there's one just funny thing when the copy, when the proofs came back from the Denison book, in those days it was before computers, and there was a thousand pages of manuscript, and the copy editor lived up in Maine, and he wrote back and he said, Very odd, you've consistently misspelled two words for a thousand pages. And I said, What were they? He said, Separate and desperate. <laughs> I think that my ex <laughs> I think of of Nick Baker's you and I being a kind of quasi biography of of Dyke and Simon has obviously written biographies of more than one person. My experience in the biographical realm is probably the least of anyone on the panel, but I'm currently working on a project that I'll tease you a little bit with a little bit, which is I'm working on an an oral biography, I don't know if that's a form that people know, where you, you, you tell it rather than in your own voice in a series of snippets from various people, or rather the way that a documentary movie works. So anyway, there's a, a documentary filmmaker who's been, been making a film about um, an, a, a major American cultural figure whom I'm not allowed to disclose, I'm afraid. And I've been hired to take the material, sort of 10,000 pages of transcripts, and turn 10,000 pages of transcripts from the interviews that were conducted about this iconic figure and make of it an oral biography. And I've gone through so I've been spending about the last couple of years on this project and am nearly done with it. And um, I'm sure this is quite common to biographers, but the waves of loathing and love yeah. that vacillate <laughs> by, day by day and year yeah. by year and month by month is really startling that, um, you know, now I love him because the book is, is done. But <laughs> there, there were periods when I just really, pardon? It's a him. It's a, it's a him. That much we know, right? <laughs> but um, I, that's a fascinating, and I, I'm not sure I have the the language to talk about sort of transfers and all that, but I think that there's one very strong thesis that I push about the subject having to do with World War II, and I'm curious to hear from the biographers. Like, I'm so suspicious of my thesis. I, again, talk about Philoctetes. I really argue the wound and the bow as being the central trope of this person's life, and I argue the war as being a kind of the central wound that he, wound that he spent the rest of his life trying to turn into a kind of bow of art. And I'm, you know, that's my obsessive trope. I sort of I've run that trope through virtually everything that I write. And um, I guess I'm always questioning to what degree I'm actually offering some insight into the person, or to what degree I'm just obsessively running my own tape loop mm. through his life. I mean, I wonder how biographers worry that issue at all. Well, I'm just curious, do you feel, when, I, I can tell from what you say that you do, do you feel completely crazy at a certain point uh, that you have no sense of reality when you're into this other life? Uh, um, do you lose your bearings? I mean, that to me is very scary. Well, I have to confess, no, I don't. I mean, I... I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the subjects, uh, Murray, Minor, William Smith, who created the first geological map in, in the world, and, and um, the latest fellow, uh, Needham, are 
I love them all, and I love them when I started, and I love them when I finished, and I didn't go through a period when I, when I loathe them. And in terms of, of transference, yes, I would have adored to have been each one of them, and, and I. So there's a sort of frustrated lack of fulfilment because I could not have been the editor of the OED. I could not have created science and civilization <coughs> in China, and I'd love to have done. Um, so to, to that degree, there's an enormous amount of envy, but, but admiration, and. Um, but never did I get unhinged. I want, I want to know what your secret is, Simon. How did you manage that? I, I, I didn't go to psychoanalysis. That made it. Nick? Well, I, I, I do feel totally crazy. It's absolutely. Most of the time, you, when you're in, in any, any kind of. Uh, self-defined province of human activity. I mean, you pick a war or you pick a little scrap of your own self, a guy riding an escalator, I wrote very autobiographical novels, any of those things that the, the, that little place that you're in expands to fill the whole universe and that can be, it's, it's actually a very, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling but it's also a scary feeling because I, I found that, I mean, I, I could tell you all about the, at the book that I'm working on now, is, is all in the period of 1950 down to 53. I know the Undersecretary of State. I know the entire cabinet. I know all this stuff, but I'm very shaky on what Obama's doing at the current <laughs> moment. You know, so it's an <laughs> odd feeling. That it's like what some, some English essayist wrote about how the, these, these poor scholars know the, uh, all the streets of Rome better than they know their own neighborhood. And, it's, and actually, I think, yeah, that's the right way to do it. Who was the Undersecretary of State? What? Who was the Undersecretary of State? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm just curious. Well, well the Adjutant was the Secretary of State. Well, I, actually, now you caught me. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But no, I mean, I think I think it is it is it is a wonderful, crazy feeling to be in the middle of any uh, of 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 this this idea that you're going to so completely cast your nets around another person. And there's always a moment where there's some little piece of that person that sums him or her up completely. There's some little moment where the, of of vulnerability often, or uh, a mistake, or or a, a piece of something that he or she had on on the mantle. That somehow sums the person up, and that becomes the kind of proxy of the whole, of the whole individual. Well, at the, at the risk of being stubborn, how did you how did how do you choose? Again, how do you choose your subject, or how does your subject choose you? You've you've all been talking about, well, in in your case, you were chosen, but you've all been talking about what what happens once the choice is made. And I guess this is the psychoanalytic part of it. Maybe you don't know. Uh, how you chose until after you're done? How, how do you? How did you choose to write about, say, Vanessa Beecroft? Well, I was very interested in eating disorders and art, and it's every single perversion has its bard in this culture, and that's uh, one that doesn't. Um, and it's a subject that just seems to be so repulsive that, or that I wanted to find out why is that? I mean, you know, bondage and. Necrophilia, you name it. Someone has written a novel or made a film about it. And she was one of the few artists who was willing to talk about it and who actually uses it in her work. So I thought that this would be, this would be really interesting. Um, and I write about hunger, I guess, a lot. And so that you write about what? hunger in one form or another uh -huh. a lot. So that was why I wanted to, to write about that. But I think sometimes that moment you don't know why you've chosen the subject, it becomes apparent to you. And sometimes with Colette, the more I worked on it, the more I wondered why I had chosen her. And I didn't choose her. I was sort of, I was casting around for another subject. And two friends of mine who both happened to be novelists, a man and a woman, wrote to me the same week. And they had both been either teaching or writing about Colette. And they said, you have to do this. This is your subject. And they, uh, they had plausible reasons. So like the good little girl, uh, you know, I went out and got a contract. And then sort of eight years later, in much struggle, um, with someone who was in many ways antipathetical um, to me and another's not. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't, when you, I wanted to ask you because you said you don't have this terrible sense of unreality and you love your subjects, do you know very, very much about them before you start? Is, is it like an arranged marriage for you? No. <laughs> no, I, did, I mean, 
I came across William Chester Minor, who was the, the lunatic at the center of the Professor and the Madman in, in a peculiar way. I, I'd never heard of him. And I was reading a book about the making of the Oxford English Dictionary, um, or the making of dictionaries generally, in, in the bath one morning up in upstate New York, where I lived at the time. And there was just a footnote saying readers of this book will, of course, be familiar with the story of W.C. Minor, the deranged American lunatic murderer, who was such a <laughs> prolific contributor to the Oxford English Dictionary. And I sat up in the bath like Archimedes and said, I've never heard of this guy. And as it, by great good fortune, I had the telephone by the, by the bath. And I knew one lexicographer in the world who was a woman called Elizabeth Knowles in Oxford. And I remembered her number. And I picked up the phone. and. Dialed 01141865567. And, and she, after, there was a, a, a long pause, and I think to this day, if, if she had never answered, the book would never have been written. But she did answer, and I said, Elizabeth, this is Simon, I'm ringing. It's rather vulgar to say so, but from my bath in America. <laughs> and um, well, but, but I think she, at lunchtime, would not wish to think of me in my bath in America. Um, and I said, do you know anything about William Chester Minor? And she said, well, you're very lucky because I probably know more about him than anyone in the world. And <laughs> I wrote an academic paper about him about 15 years ago, which, if you'll do me the honor of toweling yourself dry and standing by your fax machine, <laughs> I will fax over to you. And then, and then she rang back to make sure that I had received it and said, uh, by the way, when I wrote that essay, um, I did go to the lunatic asylum in England where he was incarcerated for 40 years and I saw his medical file which was about 11 linear feet of paper but I wasn't allowed to look at it or look in it but I dare say the rules have changed in the intervening 10 years and if you can get in it into it I dare say there's a rather good story to be told okay. so I knew nothing about him at all nothing at all and the defining moment of the the, the that, that Nick talks about, I think, was the moment when he cut off his penis, and that was a defines very defining, <laughs> very <pretty> defining definitive, <laughs> <laughs> refining oh, serious, certainly. Serious. <laughs> bold, bold stroke there. Nick, yeah. a bold stroke. Uh, <laughs> well, I um, did a bold stroke. I did. I uh, um, choose. I think that I, I like to have the 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 the. Um, the large theme being illustrated by a, by a, a passing figure. So, for instance, the New Yorker once wanted me to write about, I think it was about sex in cinema, and I said, I can't, I just, I've just written two books about sex, I can't write about sex anymore. And, um, but I will write about the movie projector. And, and so they said, okay. And so I interviewed these people who knew a lot about the mechanics of the movie projector. And there was a moment where the guy was describing the way that the, the star that's the sort of crucial mechanical movement in a movie projector moved and he had a certain look and a, a, that he said the slot in a star has to be perfect and, and I, I wanted to just sort of fling him out. It's not really an, a biographical moment, it's just it's a moment of a human being saying the one thing that's most important to him in his life and then we we move on. I li that, so those are the kind of where it's not. I don't know what it's called. It's a particulate biography, or it's biography where you're just holding up a single billboard, which is, I am a guy who loves movie projectors, and then you, kind of run off the stage. And I, I like those because, those little moments um, then can can add up to a, or can imply a larger theme of, in, of obsession and interest and in, you know the human achievements and. Nice stuff like that. Judith. I totally, sorry, I want to totally clear when you say you have loading, loading towards the subject of the uh, biography yeah. or loading towards the work of doing Both. the biography. <laughs> <laughs> One leads to the other. Right? And if it is the subject, then what do you do with it? Do you disguise it? Do you No, you work it? through it because it's sort of, uh, it's an adolescent. I mean, that kind of, um, the person is dead. They're not doing anything to you except taking up most of your life. Um, and you have chosen that. And, um, um, and I, I mean, it, 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 of course, if I completely loathed, it, I would have to stop. But, but it's, a, it's an ambivalence. It's a very ambivalent emotion. And, um, and it's an occasion to work it. It is, as we were t talking 
Psychoanalytic Institute, it is an occasion to figure out why this strong feeling, what on earth they've touched that makes it so strong. Um, it's quite primitive, so, so it's... You and then you try to somehow to, bring that out and include it. You in don't, you, you leave it out of the book. You don't want it in your book. You have to do that yourself. It's work that you have to do with yourself, not in your text, I think. Although it's in there somehow, but, but it, you really have to sort of examine it. It's very interesting. My friend Jean Strauss, who's a biographer of J.P. Morgan, among other people, um, we used to run together in the country many years ago, long runs. And Morgan was giving her a terrible, terrible time, and uh, Dennison was probably giving me a terrible time, but, and, and she had just been through something with him. And I said, well, what did you do? And she said, um, I talked to him, and I asked him, um, I said, why, why are you withholding everything from me? Why won't you let me write your life? And I said, well, what did he answer? And he said, because you don't like me. <laughs> oh, yeah. And at that point, something gave and she was able to go on, so. Well, I think it's a little, I think, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't speak for Nick, but I think like the work that Nick and I do is, is different in the sense that the Judas says that, you know, you don't stage that ambivalence as part of the book. I would say that would you be yeah. my starting point. I've, yeah. I've written long essays on, on Bill Murray, on Bob Balaban, on, on John Melendez, on, uh, on David Milch. And my approach, which is different from a more traditional biographical approach, is to really stage my ambivalence as the theater in which the piece takes place. It's as much about me as it is about them, and my investment in them becomes a big part of what the piece is about. In a way, I'm, you know, I've sort of gone to school on Nick's piece, you and I, uh, about John Updike, in which he, the whole piece is about Nick's ambivalence toward his subject. At least that's the way that I read the book. But, um, but um, so I think, I mean, I could go on at length about that, but I, but I just want to draw the distinction between, it seems to me like perhaps the approach that Simon and to a slightly lesser degree Jew has taken, that I think that Nick and I as, as, as fiction writers, or at least some of my books are published as fiction, that we kind of approach it in as a more sort of Ford Maddox Ford good soldierish way in which there's a first person narrator who's ostensibly talking about a particular subject but he or she is constantly coming back to his or her own psychic psychic crux throughout is that what the Flaubert's Flaubert yeah I mean for me I would want like for the I thought when you when you mentioned Flaubert I thought you were going to talk about Julian Barnes's yeah, wonderful book Flaubert's yeah. Pair which yeah. I just I just just adore that book, and or even better maybe is Jeff Dyer's book Out of, of Sheer Rage, which is about how Dyer couldn't write a book about D. H. Lawrence, and <laughs> and in so doing writes to me the the best book that we have about D. H. Lawrence. So um, I'm very interested in that same law times ten, in which the whole thing is not just at a sort of remove, but you're constantly talking about that psychic thread between subject and um, narrator. Well, it's very interesting you were saying that by, by um, taking paragraphs from other writers and incorporating them into, in a sort of almost erotic way into the text that you're creating, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a similar sort of mer mer merging. Right, that's an interesting point. Yeah. That's a good point, actually. You're kind of cannibalizing them. You gotta love yeah, what you eat. Exactly. Communion is cannibalism. Right. I'm, I'm wondering if some of this isn't so much a distinction between uh, fiction writers and people who don't define themselves as fiction writers as between long form biography and short form essay writing. Well, not, I, the kind of novels that I used to write, I thought of as as as. 93% me, you know, they were autobiographical novels and there's that wonderful autobiographic hole, you know, you can sort of, <laughs> can, you can have that helpful confusion of how much is me in there and, and what I felt that I was doing is, is writing autobiography but cleaning it up a little bit because real life has, has messy bits that don't really fit together thematically and you have to kind of edit those out, save them for another book and so I I was 
trying to write nonfiction, but I wouldn't presume to say that it was nonfiction because I'd changed at least seven percent of what I was doing. So it was it was a novel, and that's the that's the the great divide is if you, as soon as you change one fact, you enter the world of fiction, in my opinion. And, and then people who do change a fact and don't enter the world of fiction in, a, in the official sense, don't proclaim that they're entering the world of fiction, um, are not being fair to the readers. That's um, withholding facts also would be included. Right. Which you should say right up front, I have really messed around with this. I've made up people, I've combined people, I've made up conversations. And that, so it's not a, it's not a nice, exciting, postmodern thing to do that. It's a wrong thing to do that. Well, I wait, think. if the Fermata is 93% you, that's pretty good. Well, the Fermata is physically impossible, so that's more like 65%. <laughs> the Fermata is about a guy, but it's an autobiographical book in the sense that all those thoughts went through my head. But it's a book about a guy who could stop time. This was before, before uh, remote. No, what is it called? Not remote. TiVo. TiVo. You know, the one that. <laughs> sorry. Am I the expert on, on no, such no. matters? <laughs> No, it's, yeah, it's, but anyway, this guy could stop time and he does bad things with it, but anyway, it's a 65% me, and that's, I wrote a book recently that, about the Second World War, and I wanted originally to do this kind of quest thing, what was the beginning of the war, and how would I find it out, who was a non-historian, and I found that in some ways you have to pull your own, some subjects are so horrible and big and sad and, and, I don't know, just complicated, that you really have to pull yourself out of it and stop the solipsism and the autobiography and just let the facts do it. And there's, so there's a kind of um, autobiographical decision there too, is to say, I'm not going to be part of this book. I'm going to arrange things, but I'm not going to, there's not going to be any personal pronoun I in the book at all because it's bigger than I am. You know. Do you think it's ever possible not to be part of it? I mean, I, you know, we, the blurb on the website was all, was uh, all about Eliot's tradition and the individual talent and draining the personal out of writing, which you know Eliot tried to do, you know, maybe. But do you think it's it's possible not to be involved? Well, I certainly don't. No, I think I mean what you were talking about suppressing or withholding facts. I mean there. Are, dozens of facts that I withhold for reasons which, if I analyzed them, would be fascinating and which make the books intensely personal. You can't put every fact about someone you write about. You choose what to put in, what to take out. Is this unfair to the reader? Is this unfair to the... Well, unfair at what consumer? point does it become unfair to well, the reader, exactly. I guess, is a way of asking that question. And I think at the... Well, my person who is my mentor um, always said right at the beginning of my career that the one thing you have to say to yourself the completion of a piece of work particularly a profile of somebody is is it fair and I think if you remove or add well obviously not invent but if you remove certain aspects of this person's life for one of a hundred reasons if at the end of the day you can say this is a fair portrait of this person, then I think you can live with yourself. Yeah. And in the case that we discussed earlier of Niedermuth, you said you talked about the Chinese relationship. Was that because you felt that was relevant to what you were going to write about this man, or was it uh, that was just an interesting fact, or, or no, it was, it was a significant contributor to what happened in his life? Yes, in, in the case of, of, of Needham's relationship with China, insofar as the affair with this woman who taught him Chinese and began to teach him Chinese the first time they ever went to bed together, um, <laughs> teaching him the word cigarette, because both of them were chain smokers, um, it's hugely important. It was the turning point of, of the whole book. Nonetheless, he was known from when he was 25 years old to be a... A, a, a relentless womanizer and uh, many people back then and today would regard this as reprehensible behavior and that meeting Lu Guizhen was simply part of a, a, a pattern. So does one say well he, he was a, a man who lived one aspect of his life reprehensibly but 
Mirabile Dick to one of the women with whom he had an affair then led him to do something rather extraordinary, which is to create this monster book on China. So if you didn't include that, if you minimized it as you say someone else made, then you would think that they didn't do justice to the story, to what happened in this man's life. Well, well exactly. But I can see some people would be uh, appalled by his behavior and, uh, and would have a completely different take on it. But on the other hand, there is this one assailable fact that the Chinese woman was the person that sparked his interest in China. So she has to come into the story. Do you oh, I was going to, yeah. I don't know what you were going to say, but I was going to circle back and sort of of quarrel with something that you said. I don't know if you were, you were, you were sort of anticipating that, but I mean, I, to me that was surprising or interesting to me what you said about the, the moment that, I forget how you exactly phrased, but just that, you know, for you, your novels are 93% based on autobiography and 7% invention. The moment that you alter a fact, it's, it's fiction. I guess I'd want to put a lot of pressure on that idea. I mean, for me in the sense that, you know, memory is a sort of dream machine to me, and composition is a fiction-making operation by definition. And so for me, I'd want to, I mean, I guess the argument of this book, of Reality Hunger, is that I want to try to, you know, try to blur the line as much as possible between genres in the, the service of existential excitement and sort of moral uh, and sort of psychic confusion that, that that's closer to what the human human animal experiences rather than these sort of neat generic categories and um, I guess for me I just think facts are you know highly dubious and maybe I'm just sort of a a, a textbook postmodernist in this way, but I, I, um, I'm not sure how 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 relevant this is to our exact topic. But it's I totally guess relevant. I guess um, for me, I, I I've published you know three works of fiction and several works of nonfiction. I think of that almost a sort of librarian's choice as to which are called fiction, which are called nonfiction. I make up a huge amount of things in my nonfiction. I change things, I alter things, I compress things, I leave stuff out. I, there's a certain amount of invention in the nonfiction. The, the fiction tends to be extremely autobiographical and I, I want to really sort of make us think in relatively new ways about genre. That the books that I tend to love the most I think there's a, a really wonderful quote by v Walter Benjamin who says, all great works of literature either found a genre or dissolve one. And I think that's just, a, that's sort of my mantra of late. Like, how would you push back against that idea? Well, I, I, of course, you're right. I mean, of course, we're, we're messing around with things all the time. We're fallible human beings. We don't remember things accurately. We get people's names wrong. We can't remember the un undersecretary of state. I mean, <laughs> we, 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 we're, we're messing up all the time. But, but I just still cling to this notion that there's a moment where I'm going along. I'm, I'm sort of on the line of a paragraph. I'm halfway through it, and I'm tempted to tell an untruth. I'm tempted to, the, the gravitation is very extreme to say something that, that, that makes me look better than I actually was at that moment. But this is, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I've defined my genre as autobiography, I feel duty bound to make myself look bad. I mean, make, or, or, or at least to, I guess this is the way I would say that that as a biographer, to the extent, the very limited extent that I've ever done this, but I think you do this beautifully, is you want to suppress those t human moments where, the, where your subject just looks ineffectual and wasting his life and not, you, you want to you suppress the moments when they don't have a certain thread of nobility. When you're talking about yourself, though, you really want to make sure to to stress those moments where you're you're not 
where you really are not working properly. We, we want to make you make sure, bend over backwards to make yourself look bad, uh, because that's truer. So, well, James I, Fry did that, but he. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, okay. Now that's he was lying. You yeah. see. That, that's why I I still think that. Um, because he's the guy who made up all that he's stuff. He's the guy who made all that. He wrote about that too. Didn't yes. He? Yeah, well, ultimately, yes. Yes. Right. So I have. Yeah. What's the difference? Okay. I, yeah. I have I this. Unfortunately, I do have this very primitive notion that that there is a that that you can you you're moving along and you can actually say I will, I will tell the truth here or I will, clean it up, and I feel that one has a duty if you're do, writing nonfiction. To tell the truth. But, to, to, but you to, seem, but, David, to think that I mean, nonfiction doesn't really exist in in your world. I mean, you say large, I make things up and I everything's fugitive and everything's what fugitive? Yes. Yeah, but I I try to foreground that fugitive quality. I mean, it's not as if I say the Under Secretary of State in 1952 was. Was Condoleezza Rice? I mean, I don't, I don't sort of remake the world in that sense. Oh, thank God. And I try to stage my own uncertainty about that. To me, nonfiction or essay is a way to foreground contemplation as the the motor for the work rather than story. That's to me the great excitement that nonfiction or the essay mode has is that what drives the work is consciousness as opposed to narrative. That's to me the essential distinction between nonfiction and fiction, or at least the kind of nonfiction that I'm interested in, and sort of the more traditional novel. And I, it's a, obviously it's a, a, a slippery slope, and one can lead into sort of James Fry land. And I, and I, to me, Fry is an interesting case, and I don't want to lard our discussion with sort of James Fry stuff, but he is an interesting example for me of someone who was, I mean, he's not a good writer in my view, but, and I don't want to use him to defend him exactly, but to me he was used as a kind of scapegoat for the culture's sins. That he, I mean, there's, Vivian Gornick, the essayist, is, uh, is really good on this subject, that, you know, that memoir belongs to literature. It doesn't belong to journalism. There's an ancient tradition, you know, from St. Augustine to Joan Didion of serious literary literary essay. And somehow, of late, the memoir has gotten misfiled as a species of journalism so that papers say, like the New York Times, are hugely hugely invested in parsing the truth value of each work of nonfiction. So it's a, what I call trial by Google, you know, <laughs> in which a work is vetted for, you know, this work used the word the, and we found the word the in this previous work. This is therefore a flawed work. <laughs> and I really want to completely change how we think about genre, how we think about appropriation, quotation, uh, citation, and the legibility of truth. I mean, like for instance, when Nick was talking about, you know, it has to be true. Wow, I would put that in, you know, quadruple quotation marks, <laughs> wouldn't you? I mean, I just, I mean, I. But we, we, there's a difference between factual and true. I think that's an important. <laughs> distinction to make as someone who works for a magazine with the last checking department on the planet. Uh, and every sentence, every fact, every name, every anything that you write is going to be checked and it has to be factual. Truth is another matter. I once had a great professor of English, J.V. Cunningham, who was a poet, and he said poetry is a pattern of inclusions and exclusions. And um, and even though you are writing a text for the New Yorker, 5,000 words, each one of which will be checked, uh, you have still excluded a whole pattern of words. And you are not doing, I never do not set out to be anything other than as factual as I can be. But I know as I'm going, I mean, I'm, I, I wrote about Lenny Riefenstahl, the woman who lived to be 102, and I had 5,000 words to cover her entire career. Lots going to get left out, and that right. is defining. I mean, I'm the one leaving them out, those right. words out. So true is a very tricky word, um, and um, but I think in the, just to James Fry is he was selling his book as a self-help 
as a sort of inspirational Triumphant, self, yeah. not as a work of literature. And therefore, Trail. he made the genre mistake, or he made he falsified the genre. He didn't falsify the work as much as he falsified the genre, and I think that was what was so immor right. immoral. Right. So, is that true of the person? You know, I, I'm forgetting names. Also, the, the one, the transvestite author, who you know, who invented the Leroy J T. Leroy. Yeah, Leroy. Leroy. It's a, well, it's a different form of literary fraud, actually. That was just a, a pen name to me. I mean, that was yeah. just a pen name. I mean, that was just... Okay, it was a, it was a pen name, but it had a, a, bi a biography, if you will, attached to it. And the biography was, you know, this was this kid who'd been a transvestite hooker. But it wasn't... That's marketing, though. I mean, that's just yeah, marketing. That was marketing. I mean, the work stands <laughs> yeah. as a work of fiction. Then there was a kind of clever backstory that was derived. I mean, I again. Well, I argue this at length in that book, but but uh, to me, that's a, a useful term. Um, Patricia Hempel, who's a, a wonderful essayist, talks about has she? Um, what was the topic that she was a part of? Memoir. Memoir. And um, the, the the term that she uses that she says it would be useful if we thought about the literary essayist, the way we think about the lyric poet as a kind of speaker. For instance, there's a quote, I come here a little bit too well prepared, but there's a line by Emily Dickinson where she says, uh, sorry, I have it here in a second. No, it's not that one. That one I have too, but um, eh, where is I it? Heard it's of really. Five when I died. No. No, it's. Um, sorry, it's it's good though. So I'm gonna give. Just give me a moment here. There it is. She says, "When I state myself as the representative of the verse, it does not mean me, but a supposed person." I find that a very useful way to think about the essayist. It's not the way that we typically do. Can you say that again? Please? Sure. When I state m myself as the representative of the verse, it does not mean me, but a supposed person. You know, that's not the way we think of the essays, but it's the way I think about it at, at ground level as a working, a working essayist. That Patricia Hempel says that we, that we need to think of the personal essay as the way we think of the lyric poet that it's a kind of, you know, sculpted voice, a kind of projected speaker. The, the, when we read Plath or Lowell or Berryman or Larkin or, or Dickinson or, or Whitman, we think of it as a kind of amplified speaker who's closely, closely, closely related, perhaps 93%, you know, to use Nick's formulation, of the speaker, but there's 7%, and we just take it for granted as sort of poetic license, as rhythmic clarity, all kinds of things. And it's not conventional wisdom that we think of the serious literary essays. I mean, Nick mentions Confessions of, Confessions of an Opium Eater as a, a crucial book of his, of his youth. Thomas De Quincey, that book is fabricated. De Quincey lied dramatically about his recovery from, from opium. He presents himself at the end of that book as recovered from his opium addiction, he was nowhere near <laughs> recovered from opium addiction. He was a severe opium, op, opium, opium addict. But, but in order to create a gorgeous, timeless literary masterpiece, he had to use that 7%. Do we want to call that a work of fiction? No, it's, it's essay. But he lied in order to become a kind of supposed person. So that's an argument I'd want. See, I, I think he, it would have been even better if he'd actually told, he, there's a beginning, that in the beginning of the opium meter, he says that he was compelled to take opium first because he had these terrible stomach pains. I didn't believe it for a second. <laughs> um, and, and I think it is a gorgeous, tremendous work of English literature, you know, but I think that, that to, to the extent that he is not being, Here's the phrase that Nabokov uses, that, that speak memory is true to his remembered life. And I think that everybody who is writing autobiography has a, a duty to be as true as possible to your own remembered life. And if, because if you, 
And the fact checker, Harold Ross's idea that there are these facts out there, that there's kind of, <laughs> there's the kind of drawers and you can open up and there are facts. That's actually a very useful um, absolutist notion because, because if, we, if we hold on to that and say that we're going to be able to verify names, dates, the titles of things, when if somebody took a left turn or a right turn, what's on a certain street, the fact that all that factual surrounding, the, that that is so important, I think, to the kind of emotion you put into a book. If you say this guy is to be trusted, he's really taking his best shot at telling us what actually happened. And to the extent that he's not, he's just he may have made a mistake, or he he misremembered. He combined two people because he was a fallible person. I I want to hold on to that. I don't. I want to say. De Quincey should have, you know, fessed up. Well, he was, fessed he, up. He was wasn't he governed by the generic conventions of narrative in the early 19th century? There had to be a recovery. You couldn't write that book in the 19th. I mean, it's, this is the story of the Don Quixote of Pierre Menard that uh, Borges wrote. You, 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 you couldn't write the book in the 19th century that had no recovery in it in some way. I don't way. know about that. I mean... Or could you? I, I mean, I, you may be others, Simon and Nick, or, or everyone else is probably a better s scholar of that. But I mean, I would go to speak, speak memory, like the moment in Speak Memory where Nabokov talks about, he says, I'm trying to remember the name, and it's the name Floss. Is it his dog? The dog. He goes, and it's coming, it's coming, here it comes, Floss. <laughs> you believe that? I don't believe that for a second. I want to believe that. Total, I cried when I read that. <laughs> it's it's a total fiction. No, I total no, fiction. I don't I don't believe that it is total. I hope it's not. Well, I, I, I want to ask you what, from what you all off where he told me that. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the idea that autobiography and memoir are about the remembered life. You know what is a remembered life? What does it mean to remember a life? I mean, it's not. I, I, it seems to me that. That you both that you have really different ideas, the two of you, about remembered lives, and I'd like to know what the other two panelists think about remembered lives, what it means to have a remembered life. Well, it's very interesting because I'm writing about Laura Ingalls Wilder, who claimed that the Little House on the Prairie books were true. Um, they are fiction, and they were written collabor collaboratively with her daughter. They were based on her real life, and she researched it. She was 65 when she published the first one, and so th these were events that had taken place at least 50 years, 55 years, 50, 60 years in the past. Um, so she researched things, um, and then uh, she and her daughter shaped these narratives about pioneer life. Um, they rem Memory isn't anything to do with either fact or truth. It can be, it can have to do with sincerity, it can have to do with uh, what you believe uh, you lived, what, uh, I, I mean, one of the things about the fact checkers, is you write something that you're sure of, that mm -hmm. you don't, don't even, you're not double checking because you're sure, but completely wrong. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, I don't know, memory is a form of, of um, recording uh, artistic recording or practical recording or whatever, but um, not of, uh, um, you know, not of chronicling somehow. It's different. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily chronicle what happened. I, with, with, uh, with Nick, I, I believe it's important to have some kind of basis for trusting what you read in something that's, uh, literature is different. I, I give you nearly all of it. To, to mix mix genres and to challenge mm -hmm. boundaries. But I think there has to be some sort of reliable place to go uh, to read what did in fact happen as opposed to what in the Little House books. Oh, sure, that's sort of incontestable. Obviously, I want that drawer of facts, too, on some level. I mean, of course, that would be Scary. preposterous yeah. to empty out that drawer completely. But part of it depends on sort of, of providence. I mean, that if it's a New Yorker article, there's a certain sort of frame around it. And if it's, uh, you know, Jeff Dyer's Out of Sheer Rage, his, to me, sort of wonderful book on D.H. Lawrence, that there's a kind of, what was the term that you used, a sort of uh, uh, fugitive quality of it, where it's, you know, that it's, there's an existential 
frame that's starting to, to bend around the thing from the very beginning, that, that we know we're in the land of uh, sort of dubity from the very beginning. But you're also describing a wonderfully, you, what's something that you're seeking to create is a wonderfully intimate, and therefore troubled, relationship with your reader. Um, and what I think we're talking about is a more formal relationship, like not calling up your friend and telling, oh, I'm in my bath, and not only that, you know. So there's, there's a sort of a, a, a more old-fashioned, if you like, sense of propriety in relation to the, you know, the formal relation, the boundaries, and you're, you're really interested in a very interestingly intimate new I think that's really fair. I think that's, ex that's really the heart of my project. I think that's exactly true. I th I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. It's just this business about the remembered life. I think it is fascinating. My wife and I were talking about it this morning, knowing I was coming here today. I mean, I have lived an extraordinary life. I mean, in the, having been a foreign correspondent and gone to see you know, extraordinary places and extraordinary events and eyewitness to all sorts of things and weird things have happened. Um, I spent quite a long time in prison in Argentina and that kind of thing. But I tend to remember, I think, we're talking specifically about, because I don't keep a diary, never have, wish I had, of course, now, <laughs> because people say, well, why don't you write an autobiography? And I think, well, I'll leave that for when I'm really short of cash. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe now is the moment, actually. <laughs> Next <laughs> month. Uh, foreclosures threatening, yes, exactly. Next month. But, but what do I remember? And I think, generally, the, the less pleasant and the less savoury and the things I'm less proud of, I get vis very fuzzy about. <laughs> and uh, probably it's a rather good thing. My memory is sort of tactful memory. And it only remembers the, the better stuff, I think. I mean, like, interesting about this, the storm that I came here, at the moment I remember very vividly exactly how many trees I had to climb over to get to the borrowed car to drive down to New York. The villagers in this village say it's the worst storm they can remember in 15 years. At the moment, obviously, it's 24 hours ago, I remember it vividly. I feel any biography, autobiography that I would write now would be bound to have the great storm of the 12th of December 2008 written. But in five years, it may be completely irrelevant, completely tedious, not worth mentioning. So I, if I ever think about an autobiography, I know that my memory is eliding the uninteresting, the pieces I'm not proud of, and in the end it would be a sort of triumphalist biography, I fear. <laughs> and then no one would believe it. I'd be in the same boat as James Fry. Well, unless you did what Nick did and you and I, he writes about all of his, uh, his, his failed rememberings, uh, or many of his failed rememberings. He'll remember something that Updike wrote and then uh, let us know, but always in square brackets, often in square brackets, yeah. that he remembered it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I thought I th that's... A, that's Actually, the the, des the desire was there to be, to to cleave to some primitive notion of accuracy in the midst of the fact that I was going to mess up. I was going to to remember things wrong. And I think it's interesting that that, that you quote Dickinson because it's the fascinating thing about poetry is that it is true. There's no nonfiction and fiction poetry. It all goes into the poetry mm -hmm. section of the bookstore. It's unlike any other published. Stuff. I mean, we've got nonfiction over here in Barnes and Noble and fiction over here, but we, you don't ask. I'd like to see the nonfiction poetry shelf. It just doesn't <laughs> exist. You know, so it's some, there's something special about poetry, but I just think that there is something of a risk. If and I'll give you an example. I was writing along in you and I, and it's about Updike, and I'm describing the scene where I talk to Updike in the in the Harvard Lampoon, which is a building I wasn't even supposed to be in, because I never went to Harvard and never was part of the Harvard Lampoon, but this friend of mine had gotten me in there, and there was Updike. And I talked to him, and he somehow said, would, I, I, uh, somehow he asked, were you here? And he pointed sort of to the Harvard <laughs> Lampoon building, and I went to Haverford College, not Harvard. And I <laughs> said, so I sort of said, yeah, you. <laughs> And I, I, I really wanted to skip over that. I really, I mean, the, the point was that I was at, a, at a, a real railroad crossing there where I could have veered towards truth or untruth, and I felt that I had a, 
a duty to, to kind of say that I had actually lied to the guy I was writing the book about. So that's what I mean about the... the oh, sure. I mean, that's a completely lovely moment that, that virtually makes that book. So, I mean, I, of course, those are the things I'm really pushing for, is that kind of candor to create the, intima the intimacy Judith was talking about. So, yeah, I mean, it's more that... Oh, well, anyway, I want, want to endlessly play on, on my hobby horse here. But. <laughs> Judith, what kind of truths do you think biographies can tell? And also... What, what kinds of untruths are biographers allowed to engage in? Well, again, I want to insist on this distinction between truth and fact. I think, I think you can tell the facts in a shapely and literary way. I think the truths uh, have a kind of iridescence. They, they will shimmer forth from your sentences and then disappear again. That's up to the reader. I, I, I really think that, that, that a well-written book will give the reader that freedom to find the truths there, not that you bury them like a kind of Easter egg hunt and, and you know, they're there to be found. And I never know. I mean, you read you, what you said about me. It was wonderful. And I don't, I'm not conscious of planting truths there. But every once in a while, yes, there's a sentence, 10 sentences in, in 500 pages. Um, but um, my son called me. He was, he's taking Taoism. And he was a sophomore in college. And he said, it's the first, the first poem in the Lao Tse. And he said, it's so hard, Mom. In the beginning, the nameless diverges from the things that are named. That is the mystery. He said, what is the mystery? <laughs> and um, uh, the, the, yes, that is the mystery. Writing is naming. And it's all the, the nameless is the mystery. And, and so, um, I don't know. You, you, you approach the truth of a life, but you don't grasp it. You don't get to it. You can just suggest. You can only suggest, I think. Simon? Repeat the question. What are the truths well, and, yes. or untruths that, bi that biographers can tell? Well, you can restore a reputation. You can yeah. damage a reputation hugely. In the case of one of my people, William Smith, I was enormously proud to have resurrected him from complete oblivion and turned him into a, a heroic figure, which I truly believe him to be. And I thrilled that the, I mean, most people here will not know very much about him, but he, he was a, a, a laboring man uh, in England who happened upon a great geological truth and worked on his own for nearly 20 years to create an extraordinarily beautiful map which underpins, insofar as Geology is the root of every single thing in this room. Um, our economies, our, our, our future is, our development is, is economic humankind. So he was a hugely important figure. Well, his map was plagiarized and he uh, was ruined financially and went to debtor's prison and all sorts of terrible things happened to him. And then, fortunately, uh, the story ends rather nicely. But the map. His original map hangs in a building in London, completely obscured behind a pair of curtains, and no one up to the publication of this book ever went to see it. So many Americans rang on the doorbell of the place where it was stored, saying, we want to see this map. I mean, this map changed everything. The map that changed the world was the title of the book. That eventually the society in which it was held reconstructed their entire lower floor, put in a new front door, and hang, hung the map immediately in front and allowed people never to have to ring the bell again, but just come in. And I think if there's no other achievement I make in my life to have restored William Smith from total obscurity to a place where opposite Fortnum and Mason in London, anyone can <laughs> pop in and see his picture and say, or see his map and say, what an extraordinary achievement this was, is a small triumph of the biographer's art. It is. Put a very small one, but that's no, no, the kind of thing. Entirely different. But, but, but you, were, you were dealing with a, a subject who had, uh, it, it's not ambiguous. You're, that, it's not ambiguous. He was a great man, an, an obscure great man, who did something on his own that it was incredibly praiseworthy. And, and it had been forgotten, and he had been treated badly by history. And you righted the wrong in, in a way. 
Um, yes, but I'm certain that if, if Walter Benjamin had looked at William Smith, he would have found a whole host of ambiguities. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a, a, an industry could thereby be created of you know, reinterpretation of William Smith. I, I cleave to a much simpler um, line of thinking at the moment in my career, anyway. Perhaps. Maybe I should rephrase my question. As no, 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 no. It was a lovely question. No, it's a question about interpretation, uh, which seems to me to be a, a bridge between truth, and, between truth, as you're talking about it, and, and facts. I mean, aren't, aren't facts interpretations? What's in the, what's in the drawer, Nick? Well, I, it really helps if you have audio. If you can hear the person's voice, there's a certain, there's a certain, there's just a, a richness of knowledge that you can draw from. You can understand whether they're trustworthy, whether they have one of those flat affect kind of voices. You can make all sorts of, you can really fall in love with a person because they have a certain kind of believable voice. If you don't have the voice, and, or let's say you're reading the life of Samuel Johnson, <clears throat> You have to kind of extrapolate the voice, you know, and you have to kind of pretend, you have to act out the fact that the man was twitching, and, and then and eventually you can feel the same love for the guy. He had scars all over his face, you know, he's twitching, he had all these compulsions. Every time he walked past a tree, he had to kind of touch it. I mean, this was a man with all kinds of things going on, and yet out of his mouth was all these hilariously funny, strange things. So eventually you get the audio, and it's a, but but it's it's harder. So when you're writing about modern people, thank goodness. I mean, we have, you know, we have archives. You can go and you you look through the finding aid for the archives, and you have all the letters, and that's fine. And you have their memos that they wrote as official people. But then there's a little place where you can maybe watch a 15 minutes of a movie about them, or some audio, and that 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 little tiny snippet of time is sometimes the most helpful thing you get. You can sort of start with that. So that's part, that's the big thing in the drawer, in a way. Yeah. Um, I, it's funny because I knew that there was a film of Denison uh, taken, made in the late 50s, and I, um, it was hard to get a hold of. But then when I knew where to get it, I didn't watch oh. until I had written the first draft. I did the opposite. I didn't want to hear... I didn't want the voice. I thought it would. I thought it would be louder than the voice of her books for me, and um, you know, the, of trying to hear this voice through the language that through the through the through the. Did language. you then change the draft after listening? Um, no. It, it, it oddly enough, it didn't change. Uh, I I thought, oh, she's uh, she's. She, it's more effectively affected than than I thought, but not in a way that really changed my view of her. And I thought, oh yes, she's performing. This is the performance of old age and of celebrity, and she's, she's, uh, it, it, she was performing herself. But I, by then, knew her really well, so I wasn't. Uh, it didn't sway me. But interesting that you didn't want something to perhaps alter your, by then, I won't say preconceived, but mm -hmm. conceived judgment of her. I think it was it was also a question of, of intimacy. I didn't want the intimacy of mm. seeing her in the flesh. Uh, I, I wanted that that sort of distance, and um, uh, uh, and it, and I kept it. It because she was such an overwhelming character. She wanted you could feel her from beyond the grave, you know, wanting you to, to wanting you to to become her protege. As she had sort of ruined others. So what was um, the two step that you took before you just went and leaped into her life? And you went, I was really curious about that book. You know, what, what made you write, write that book? Yeah. Um, I was very young at the time. I loved her work. Um, uh, and I was writing about lost women for Ms. It was in the mid-70s. And um, I wrote about her, the only piece that gave me absolutely no trouble in my entire life. I impersonated, t talk about this, uh, in the piece, which was supposedly, again, also the only piece that was not non-fiction purely. I, I invented and impersonated an old Danish countess. I wrote about Denison in, in her voice in the first person. Uh, there was no notice with the piece that it was not, uh, that the interview wasn't real. It fooled a number of people including Denison's executor and I had the best time in my life and the only time that I've ever, anything's ever come with that. And so after that someone wanted to commission a biography. I'm not knowing enough to, to say no, I said yes. And that was it. Oh. 
I guess the examples that come to mind to me are two. One, the, the oral biography I've been working on. I, again, I was, again, I'm a very sort of, very much an apprentice biographer, but that I was, I, there's a particular thesis that, that drives the, or, the oral biography, as I've said, having to do with war and wounds and et cetera. And very late in the project, we found out what the subject's favorite movies are. He has sort of, he's a, quite a film fanatic. And um, every single film that he's, that he's obsessed with matches exactly the thesis of the book. So that, that was certainly gratifying. That was sort of, you know, the thing on the mantelpiece, the audio, whatever it was, if there's a kind of truth. I mean, you know, there's like 12 films that he loves and every one sort of fits our preconceived thesis. Would you like to tell us one so we can try and work out who this yeah. chap is? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to be coy, but I just terribly litigi terribly litigious a, a collaborator on this project, but that's an entirely different subject. But, and then the, a, a sort of less flattering story to conform to Nick's thesis, make sure that we tell not particularly flattering stories about ourselves, is uh, this book of mine that was published earlier this year, The Thing About Life is That One Day You'll Be Dead, which features a quasi-biography of my father. The book is a kind of meditation on the brute facts of corporeal existence, just trying to take the human body from birth to death through quotation, through, through a lot of anecdote, and through data, and also sort of using my 98-year-old father as a kind of life force to counter my middle-aged malaise, that I'm the sort of, fifth, in the book, I sort of phrase myself or sculpt myself as the sort of 50-year-old uh, neurasthenic who's more obsessed with death than he should be. And I sort of needed a figure to push, push back against that. People who were reading earlier drafts of the book found it rather you know, shockingly, you know, somewhat depressing to read. And <laughs> we needed what, what Northrop Fry would call a sort of blocking figure. And so uh, relatively, late, <laughs> relatively late in the book, because the father is rather a crucial figure in the book, but relatively late in the book, my father got added to the manuscript, and he's sort of a central figure in the book. And the donné of the book is that it's really the father drives the book, but in fact he was a very late uh, part of the book. And anyway, the point I'm trying to get to is that my sister and my half-brother and half-sister, you know, barely recognize the portrait of my father in the book in the sense that it's my father, but it's a highly sculpted portrait. It's a biography, but it's a biography that fits the thematic contours of the book. He's a kind of theme carrier. He's a host for the life force in the book. It's true to him and to that extent, but there's a whole, whole other story about him that didn't get told because that didn't fit within the contours of this particular book. I, I think that we should throw it open to the attendees and um, I, I, I really like that we don't know what we think about this collectively. I think that's really great. But they should all try to ask real questions. Yes, ask real questions, Philosophical please. Philosophical actuation. Factual or real? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, truth. Larry Cutler, uh, Mr. Baker, uh, you mentioned how uh, the character, you want to get the truth, and uh, if it's not too sympathetic, you may not want to uh, go with it. But isn't it true sometimes that uh, to, if you go with the truth, you, emo uh, you will emotionally get to the truth and emotionally get to what you're trying to do, so that will be even deeper. And that uh, sometimes there's no character that actually is, that one likes until maybe the end. And the greatness of it may be how you write it. Isn't that true? Oh, yeah, I think, I think that's true. That's true. I, I, 
I was. I wrote a book that's about the beginnings of the Second World War. Well, obviously Roosevelt is is the is one of the great characters, and and there was a moment late in the writing of the book where I read a piece in the New York Times that was about Roosevelt's love for the Navy, and it described the interior of the White House and the fact that in every room there were ships models, and that the, the house actually had so many ships models that the that the steward of the White House was trying to figure out where to put them all. And it's uh, and I felt that that Roosevelt's real passion for everything having to do with the Navy explained things in the book that that uh, led into Pearl Harbor and things, and that I therefore uh, that that this this tiny nugget was it wasn't unflattering or flattering it was just interesting it was just unforgettable that this is a man who had packed the white house with ships models including all the models of the ships that he had helped to um to bring into being during the first world war so i i it's 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 just you know that's the kind of thing that you think that little piece will just lay out something that will then Combined with other pieces in the reader's mind, and and you know you'll end up with a notion of Roosevelt that's maybe a little bit more confusingly rich than the notion that you had by reading an authorized biography. It's a little like Eliot's uh, objective paralysis, the thing that's leading you. Yeah, if you if you if you deal with the, that book was I tried to do it in fragments. So if you deal with a a bowl full of jagged fragments, you want each one to to take you somewhere that will or, or, or hurt in a slightly different way and that you'll end up with a kind of a, you'll end up trying to make a network between all these things that will be different than the than the received idea about the beginnings of the second world war yeah, yeah. sure My name is Sandra Sherman, and I wrote a book about um, Daniel Defoe, who, who was an 18th century um, writer. And when I finished it, it was reviewed quite substantially in the scholarly press. And the reactions were all over the place. But one of them that interested me was that many people said that I had turned Daniel Defoe into the first New York Jewish intellectual. <laughs> not been my intent. <laughs> and so my question is, have you ever written something biographical or and found that people had interpreted it um, as if you had written sort of a crypto autobiography and that you, as a scholar, knew that nobody would be interested if you had written your own biography, and so that you used this as a stalking horse to really get out all those things that you had really been ruminating about and thinking about and that bothered you. The book was all about uncertainty and precariousness <laughs> and, you know, not knowing and irony. I mean, the book was all about irony, and if I'd written about that in myself, who cares? But, you know, so the bottom line is people said that I had projected all this on Defoe, whereas I, in fact, thought, oh, I discovered it about him. And so I'm interested in your... <laughs> I was going to say, that's Judas. Well, I... I M.O. par excellence to me. <laughs> oh, God. Um, uh, I have a, fr a friend in France was very angry with me for writing about Colette the way I did, and she said, I really wanted to believe that she had the world's most wonderful mother and the world's best relationship with her mother. <laughs> and you disillusioned me. Why do you have to write disillusioning books? Um, and uh, it's true, um, there were a lot of disillusionments in the Colette book, and, uh, but I... I uh, I found them more interesting. I found that the, the, the truth or the facts or whatever you want to call them about this relationship were, in fact, much more interesting than the idealized and rather <coughs> sentimentalized, even though beautifully written stories of Colette and Cido. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if I... I mean, I love the idea. I don't, didn't manage to turn her into a New York Jewish intellectual um, uh, or Denison uh, 
either. Um, but uh, but I also that this is I'm always afraid of deluding myself. This is my great fear. I'm really afraid of self delusion. And at the end of Dinesen, a reporter for Time magazine, literary biography had suddenly become very fashionable. Um, asked me, that she was interviewing five or six biographers, I was the sort of new kid on the block, and she had pegged me as the one who identified with her subject. And she, and I said, but I didn't. I, I tried to stay separate from the subject. I tried to see the ways in which we were different, in which I tried not to project myself. And she said, oh, this, she kept circling around, just determined to get it. And then finally she said, I liked you. She said, can't you give me one incident in which you identified with me? <laughs> I said, well, as a matter of fact, I discovered very late in my research that we wore the same perfume, which was a very sort of odd coincidence. It was not a very well-known perfume. It was called Fraca. It's now they make it again after a long time they didn't. The article comes out. Sherman identified with her subject so much that she wore her perfume <laughs> to evoke her when she was writing. Um, oh um, so, I don't know. I mean, did all of the reviewers think you had tra transformed him into that, or did only the one which this reviewer stayed with you? Um, no, not all of them. Um, some of them had other complaints. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but enough did so that it made me rethink the whole project of scholarship, where I thought I had been going back to a time and had discovered something that had been lost for a great long time and then revived the awareness of it, whereas a lot of other people had thought that I had just come out of a PhD program in graduate school and I had picked up all this stuff and then I had just projected it back onto him through my own consciousness. And so um, some people really liked the book and others thought that I had really done a disservice to scholarship. I think time has proven those people wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because I still see it. It came out in 1996, uh, and it is still footnoted. You know, it still appears in footnotes, so it, it's had an effect. But um, I think maybe what was really going on is that I tried to change people's awareness of this guy and make them think about him in in new ways rather than an old conventional way. But that's what a good biography will do. And that maybe that shook people up considerably because they had a vested interest in seeing him in a particular way. And so they didn't know what to do and so they blamed me. <laughs> and I think as I think about this whole you know, period of my life, that's what I think happened. Well, I think that raises a really interesting question. Where is your loyalty when you write a book? My loyalty is to my reader. It's not to my subject. And um, therefore, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be disloyal to the subject on the contrary, but my reader is the real, is the real thing. So in that sense... But you're not a hate geographer. What? You're not creating a hate geographer. No. You're, you're no, right, it's not, but it's definitely the reader, so uh, so the subject will have to take his or her knocks. And I'll just say one more thing, but just very quickly. Also, I think when you're writing an, about another person, you're trying to evoke their whole environment, their whole milieu. And so sometimes people are unable to separate what you're saying about a person and what you're saying about their whole environment, and they get somewhat confused. And so they impute to you a whole lot of things. When you're really trying to mix history and, bi and biography together, and they somehow don't see what you're doing. Well, I think that this, isn't this an argument in favor of David's idea that uh, to, you know, that we really do that the genres really do get confused with each other, and that uh, it's 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 really hard to write strictly in one genre whether you're true to facts, true to your reader, or true to yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's the perceiver by, by his very presence changes of what's perceived. I mean, it's a, pr a pr pretty basic law of physics, I think. Hi, my name's Elaine Pass. I have a, this fellow bit me with the Gerards and the truth. 
Nick <laughs> 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 What I was thinking of is people writing their own um, obituaries. Like, for example, if uh, Humphrey Bogart, you know, wrote his obituary, he might have said, "I wish I didn't smoke so much." And like, I'm sorry you see cigarettes in you know every film. And if Obama, like at the end of his life, you know, commented on, I, I wish I gave up smoking, but he, he would be a different thing. Like, wh like I'd like to hear, like if you had to write your obituary, what would you say briefly? <laughs> As opposed to an autobiography that you'd have to go over yeah. and over and, and change. I mean, I would say that I, I tried to... I, I, well, I don't know what I would say, but I would say that I'd, at some point I'd try to sneak in there that I'd tried to tell the truth um, because the it truth seems to be, you know, and I wouldn't put it in quotation marks. <laughs> although, although, David, I love, I mean, I love the, the book and I, I think the, 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 the notion that you can, can get at these things by melting the barriers, I think, is a powerful thing. I just... Um, that's take true. Defoe. Okay, let's go. Let's combine these. Two. Defoe was a guy who was a brilliant journalist, and what he decided was to pull out the drawer of the plague. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called *The Journal of the Plague Year*, and he had he had lived through the plague, and he had family members who had dealt. With. He pulled out the drawer and he looked through it, and then he also embroidered and he wrote the first kind of novel that was pretending not to be a novel. It was a work of nonfiction that was presented that way. And it was supposedly a journal of the plague year. And everybody said, wow, this is, this, is the most, this is the most amazingly truthful, vivid recounting of the time of the plague. And people bought it like mad. And he made lots of money on it. And then it came out that he had faked it. Mm -hmm. And people were outraged. And I think that that, that outrage, the fact that, that, that people thought that he had done something a little bit Tricky was not was was a was a is is a part of the story. I mean, there's something there. He had made up stuff, you know. So I just mean that it's it's useful to hold on to the idea, like the innocent till proven guilty idea. You know, these very primitive notions. If you hold on to them, they they correct you from making certain mistakes or succumbing to certain temptations that are inevitably going to be part of the life of somebody who is uh, up on trial or is, or is trying to tell the truth in a book. That's all. But so I guess what I was saying is that like, if you wrote your autobiography yeah. and like, had a lot of time, like years, so you're typing away, but then a year before you know, some horrendous thing's going to happen to you or maybe not happen, you have a chance to write it, like not just be struck dead by a taxi cab <laughs> on the <laughs> Fifth Avenue, and you had a chance to write your obituary, would it be significantly different? Like, would you say, oh, I wish I never spent those years, you know, trialing on this autobiography. These are the facts. Do you think it would be vastly different? I don't know. What You're other talking people about think? a deathbed confession. It's different yeah. from an obituary. I've got so a deathbed yeah. confession is a good word. Well, so the length of it would. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how, long, how much do you well, think you'd merit? You write, what, what would you write for yours? Like yeah. you wrote, what was interesting? You were we in have prison. Other questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I'd keep it short. short. I'd say that. <laughs> I, I told you I was ill. <laughs> and other questions? I do. Yeah, right here. Oh, um, I sort of was. I was sitting downstairs. I'm so thrilled to see so many people here. Um, but I was thinking of you, but I'd like to hear it from everybody. I just finished a, a memoir, which is kind of a hodgepodge potpourri also. Um, Tell us your name. Jane Goldberg, and it's called Shoot Me While I'm Happy, Memories from the Tap Goddess of the Lower East Side. And I had to actually fire an editor. I didn't have to, but I'd like your opinion on this. Um, it came to this point where he, Gregory Hines wanted to, um, he wrote me a lot of emails. The late Gregory Hines wanted um, to turn our emails into, you know, a book, and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. My my president editor convinced me that he wasn't as interesting as I thought he was as a writer. You know how emails can be, but um, and my question really is: is um, this editor that I let go of? He was counting the ellipses that Gregory used, you know, because Gregory did a lot of, da, 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 you know, thinking. You could tell he was thinking. And I don't know why I thought of you 
but I'd like to hear from everybody. <laughs> it was something that you were saying and I was downstairs, but um, like I actually thought, ah, I'm paying this guy like $35 an hour and he's counting the ellipses. And I just wondered if, um, how, how you would have taken that as a writer um, because I think this editor really thought that he was being, he was trying to be as true to Gregory as he could be because it was a sort of, um, that's, and I didn't think it was that important to count the ellipses. I mean, I think this was sort of, we were fighting about other things subconsciously. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, there was definitely a subtext. I thought he was losing interest in the book, you know. And, yeah, and, I'm not sure where to go. I mean, I think that, Again, just going back to my own experience. Thirty-five dollars is pretty cheap for yeah. a good editor. <laughs> Actually, he, he, he was in the south. <laughs> he just so I'm not against sure you regular job. But yeah, I was kind of nervous about you know how how much it was adding up to. Anyway, just the ethical question about ellipses. <laughs> yeah, I think ellipses or not ellipses I'm in uh, I think on the oral biography I've been working on again the last couple of years I would say that part of the art of quotation is compression I mean it seems sort of silly to be again maybe we're back to truth and truth but you know I just think that if you want for instance if you want to record how people actually speak it tends to be a kind of model of ums and you knows and likes, etc. But that you want the work to vibrate with art and with focus and compression. And I, you know, not loath to say that in the oral biography I've been working on, that you know, from from an oral transcript of maybe a passage of maybe 250 words, that's full of all kinds of noise to it it's part of the accepted art of the oral biographer that there's a kind of mild compression of the text. And if the person said that she was wearing a red dress, you can't change it to a blue dress, but there is, I think, the, an implied contract between reader and writer and subject, I think, perhaps no, my that's fellow a really, That's a really, really important point that you've raised. I've done a lot of trans translation. And I, you have to do, a lot, and I don't tape interviews, so I, I, I don't transcribe them. I, I take notes and then I reconstruct them. I find it it's easier and saves more time, but it also forces you to listen more, more mm -hmm. attentively. So it is a reconstruction. If you transcribe something that someone says verbatim, it's not what they said, in fact, necessarily. That's a good point. There's a kind uh, of literal-mindedness that is a perversion of truth if right. you're too right. steadfastly loyal to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I'm, I'm not sure what you were just saying, though. But, um, there's a translation. and There's a translation that goes on when you translate a, a spoken conversation to the page, an interview into a... Into, the, into written language. Between the spoken and the written, you translate as if it were a foreign language in some ways. And therefore, you have to find, you have to, it's triangulation. It's like, it's a form of translation, it's navigation. You have to navigate. You need a third point. And that third point, if you want to call that third point truth in the, in the big sense, I'm very happy to call that truth. How did you consider the email question? The email question is sort of not as interesting. Yes. I can't get there, so I'm here. Um, I'm very interested in your... Tell us your name. Francesca Tertiana. Want to repeat it? Francesca Can you come to the microphone? I, I can't. I don't know how. Here. Oh, okay. Thanks for making the um, I'm, it just inquires into your uh, creative processes, respective ones. And I, this, your observations and experiences are so fascinating to defend. So, with respect to your creative processes, if you could think for a moment, you've spoken as a scholar, as a, as a historian, as a journalist, as a philosopher, uh, these different vantage points from which you write. Some of them leave you less burdened, perhaps, uh, Simon less burdened or tortured than others. If, if you were able to, I think to one of your favorite or least favorite pieces of work, if you were able to rework it from another vantage point, say you, Simon, the, the journalist, uh, being in 
the head uh, or be, being like Nick for a while, or uh, that orientation. Would the work pick a pick a different discipline, uh, and would the work be how would it be improved? If you were writing it, you, you for example, from, from a, um, a more a journalist point of view, as opposed to the way you write, can you tell me how something you have written would change if you wrote it uh, from another orientation, the orientation of one of your peers, a scholar, a, uh, a fact-oriented New Yorker-oriented writer, a journalist, a historian, perhaps? <laughs> Is the question too confusing? No, it's a very simple question. But oh. I, uh, it's, um, I mean, could I write my book as a woman, as it were? Okay. Um, no. Uh, well, I wouldn't want to anyway. I, I wouldn't wish to. I'd rather leave a woman to write the book about X or Y. And also, Sorry, I think well, I'd want... Would I want to write it as a historian? But I'm not a historian, but it's so not I wouldn't... want to. It's, it's, it's would... Does your orientation so skew um, what you write that it would be a different story if you wrote it from another? Well, I, your question really speaks to something that Judith said about translation. Mm. A, transla a translation is, is like a memory. It's not a copy of anything. It's something else. And, uh, you know, obviously if you do it in a different way, if you, if you, if you do something in a different way, it's different. I, I found, I went through, I looked through the books written by all these distinguished people, and I felt jealous of each one. I mean, I felt that I wanted to write, it was, this is this wonderful feeling, when somebody writes well, that you want to be that person, you crave being able to speak yeah. that way, and you can't, then you have to go back to writing the way you do write. So I guess the, the, the feeling is just that, you know, the, the moment of envy and wishing that one could write the books that sound really good. Well, I didn't think so. Would, would I know more? I, I think we need to, sorry. I think we get, we'll have time for one more. We have two, two other people. Two, so two others, two more okay. Questions. We'll do quick ones. I have an offshoot of, of some of these other questions. I was fascinated. So tell us who you are, please. My name is Bob Klein. Um, I was fascinated with the comment that, that included the things like uh, it's useful to hear the voice, perhaps, of the, uh, the person and the, pull out the drawer and listen as to add some light or shed some light to the, uh, to the biography. I also was fascinated with the concept that we'd have to go um, back in a point in time and, and understand that at, at a particular period in history, perhaps it wasn't permitted or permissible to write that you were still an addicted person and, and trying to express your own life story. So having heard all that, are we as a culture in the United States or England kind of denied the opportunity for biographers skilled as, as many of them are, to tell us something about the lives of people who grew up and were born in cultures that speak a different language and that have a different kind of uh, culture than we have here. And how, how would we have an American biographer write anything meaningful about the lives of famous foreign persons? I, I wrote two lives of famous foreign uh, people. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you have to know the language. I don't think it could be done otherwise. Hi, Jeff Reichsel. Um For me, biography at this point doesn't even seem that it can be a, a reality. How can you not include yourself in it? For instance, I'm writing a biography, if I were, about William Faulkner. The Twin Towers come down. How can I not keep that out of a book? It just seems absurd. I, I don't see how one can write a biography and keep himself or herself out of it. I wanted to throw that around. Well, wait a minute. You actually would put the Twin Towers in the biography? Well, no. I just don't see how you can exclude yourself from a biography. It seems absurd. It's anti-human. It's anti-life. How can I write six years on a book and not have myself in it? It doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Isn't the question how you're in the book and not whether you're in the book? The I mean, I, I do think that one isn't a machine and a, a writer like her subject is rooted in a particular moment. Yeah. But I, I want to I speak also in favor of distance, which has to do with the last question. Uh, an American biography of Faulkner might look different from a French biography of Faulkner. They each have their own virtues, mm -hmm. I think. Absolutely. Uh, there will be two more questions. This lady and then David. 
Um, my name is Elizabeth Mahone, and um, my question, well, it's a comment, I guess, uh, in terms of autobiography. Um, I have a blog, it's called Scandalous Women, where I write about history's most notorious bad girls. And um, what I find is for certain people like Lola Montez, they've reinvented themselves to such an extent that the stories they've invented have become reality, reality to them. So when they're writing their autobiography, they're writing what they now have come to know as their history and their, their background. And um, my second, which is actually a question, um, Amanda Foreman, who wrote the biography of Georgiana, the Duchess of Devonshire, said that for her it was a young person's biography because of where she was in her life. And if she had written it now, being a mother, she would write it differently. Um, if you were to, say, look back on your biographies of Issa Denison and Colette, would you write anything differently or take a different tact than you did when you wrote those books? <laughs> Hmm, good. I, I, I think Denison, uh, I, I was very young, I was in my 20s when I wrote it, started it, and, um, but I don't know, I, it, it I, I was trying to keep myself out of it. I was really, it wasn't about my, I, I grew up with the subject in some ways, but uh, matured in some ways with the subject, but I don't think it sounds very much like a, a very young person's prose. Um, I mean, not to say that it sounds better than a young person's prose. Uh, would I write it differently now? Certainly. But this goes to what you were saying. Every, a book takes place at the moment that it's written, um, in that sense. I'm sure Amanda Foreman is delighted she wrote the book as a young woman, because yeah. if she had written it as a middle-aged lady, it might not have attracted the attention of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, what I wanted to raise was more of a, refle or a, a thought. Say who you are. Oh, David Kirkpatrick, and I'm, I'm a journalist. But um, th this maybe is an observation that maybe you would reflect upon. Um, and I'm, I'm very struck with this issue of fact versus truth and uh, in feeling and all those those issues. Uh, and especially thinking uh, as a journal magazine journalist myself, I uh, happened to be at Fortune for 25 years, which used to be one of the only other magazines that had a very, very exhaustive fact-checking department, of which I was a part when I joined it 25 years ago. And I think it's so interesting to note that The New Yorker is the only magazine that has an extensive fact-checking department left in publishing and is also our most literary publication. What an interesting coincidence. And it isn't a coincidence, really, I think, because you were sort of getting at that, that in a way, it, it, the, the facts give you like an armature on which feeling and truth can hang. And the, the reason it's so interesting to me to, to note this is that it, you know, this whole conversation in a way is kind of a, um, it's sort of an aberration in modern culture. The seriousness of, of, of reflection that you're all addressing to this set of issues is so countercultural today. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're living in a cacophony of voices where fact is almost Ill, 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 irrelevant to most of the voices that are raised on the internet, which is where most of the voices happen to exist, but they still carry a tremendous amount of weight in, in a surprising number of precincts. So, I don't know, it wasn't really about a, a biography or autobiography, this, this observation. I was just, but it was interesting, you know, as a, someone who was at Fortune for 25 years and was a fact checker in a time when fact checking took place and then was for many years a writer in a period when there was no fact checking. It is no question in my mind, just thinking back on it, it never even occurred to me till listening today, that the truth was greater in the old days. That the, the articles carried more historical weight of feeling and truth in, when there was that insistence that Ross uh, probably brilliantly uh, brought to this because somehow the New Yorker is able to get all that other stuff in anyway. anyway. <laughs> Um, well, um, they, the, of course, the fiction isn't checked, <laughs> isn't fact checked. But um, I think it was started because uh, they were because Ross was humiliated in the early 1930s, I believe. The magazine was started in 1928 by an article that was either plagiarized or um, completely off, off, off track, and he was determined never to have that happen again, never to have egg on his face again and he was willing to throw a lot of money behind it, and it's a very expensive department. So it arose not out of a respect for art, but out of a respect for professionalism. Um, and I think uh, that everything is a corporate culture. And I think that the corporate culture of professionalism at the New Yorker, which attracts certain kind of 
behavior or certain kind of, which isn't to say that that uh, that that, uh, that subversiveness and and other things aren't as uh, without making any comparisons whatsoever. But it is a culture of professionalism uh, on the journalistic side and on the literary side. There's there is no fact checking. It's it's poetry and, and fiction. Um, but the fic nonfiction is very literary to me. Like too, that's the point I was. But can I just uh, pipe up? with a little point about the Atlantic yeah. and the New York Review of Books. I have been fact-checked rigorously in those places, and they've saved me from many stupid People errors. People Magazine, too. People Magazine. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting, I mean, they all have sort of. And they're all going away, those fact <laughs> Well, maybe so. But just in defense of the, of the oh, factual, yeah. we, I mean, I think we have a craving to trust things, and that there's a certain amount of justification for trusting People Magazine to be actually pretty much on the nose when they spell somebody's name a certain way. And that, that has to do with the fact that... Would you like in an ideal world to see fact checkers or truth checkers in publishing houses? Me? Yeah. Um, I think for certain kinds of books it's probably... Well, non-fiction. Definitely, yeah. Well, well, within limits, well, I mean... Yeah. How about a central? I mean, it'll never happen. Well, that's another industry that's imploding and baby... You know, I mean... Exactly. That's my bigger point was sort of this whole seriousness of inquiry and discourse that is taken for granted in this in this place as an institution and in this conversation generally. I just want to observe is is a jeopardy. That's all. But I think your remark about the, the about the serious <laughs> professionalism at the magazine. Yes, I mean, we are in jeopardy, and, and I just want to announce that that all people. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say it. I've meant to say it before that we need help, and we need help from the foundation, and we're a part of what's going on in the world today. So we really want to keep it going. But it's in trouble. We're in trouble. It's it's fabulous. It's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Please.